Welcome everyone as you slowly join. Just watching that participants number increase and increase. <laughs> Whilst we wait for people to filter in, um, if you are having trouble uh, seeing the screen share or uh, accessing the captions, do send us a message in the chat box um, and we can go over turning those on. You should see a closed caption button on your Zoom control panel. Um, and that should open up the closed captioning that is available. I'm using it myself, so I'll try and ensure that any issues that arise with it, um, I'll try and correct it. But welcome to our Disability History Month webinar. In a couple more minutes, we'll uh, get started. But feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. Uh, if you're from a particular organization or if there's anything particular looking forward to learning about today, we always welcome engagement. Ooh, Charlie, could you enable the chat? I have a wonderful colleague who should be able to help me with the technical challenges. Yeah, I'm just doing that now. So it should be up and running in a moment. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thank you for letting me know. Got okay, that, that should be working now. Brilliant. Please do uh, give the chat a test. And uh, just as a reminder, because I always do it, if you've got hosts and panelists toggled on only, uh, you might want to switch it to everyone if you wanted to, but you can reach us directly via the host and panelists uh, little box, because that will go to myself and Charlie, who's my little tech gremlin behind the scenes. Brilliant, we've got some university people. Nice to see some names that I recognise. And the NHS, brilliant. Fourth largest employer in the world, I think. Something like that. So, brilliant. Well, thank you all for um, joining us today. Um, hopefully you've got some nice tasty lunch um, to much along with. Um, please do feel free to put um, comment in the chat um, at any point throughout today. Um, as well as use the question and answer feature. If there's a question that you want to ask, um, or if it's relevant to the slide that I'm on, I will address it um, or we'll uh, save them to the end for a nice little chat. If there's anything else that you think you wanted to be covered today that we didn't get quite around to within the little hour that I have with you today, um, we are going to be sticking around a little bit after the webinar for those that do want to um, ask us some additional things that they want to you learn about or anything that they wanted extra classification on. So do not worry too much if we don't get to your question right away. But thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's Disability History Month, uh, my favourite month of the year, not only because Christmas is right around the corner, um, but we get to do one of the things that I'm passionate about, which is looking at the history of disability. Um, and today's one is about the UK. Um, and looking back and looking forward at where we've come from with the topic of disability history month we'll talk about in a second for those of you that haven't encountered diversity and ability before um as we did put this out on social media um diversity and ability is an award-winning social enterprise led by and for disabled people um that means that the organization that i work for dna you can see our logo on pretty much every slide right now um is run by Disabled people, majority of us are disabled. On the bottom of the slide, 85% of our team identifies deaf, disabled, or neurodiverse. So we truly are led by disabled people, uh, and the work that we do is by and for our community. Um, we do quite a lot of work, whether it's in education or in um, the, the, the wider sector of uh, the UK, and it's all about making impact and 
improving society for uh, ourselves as disabled people, but the world community as well through using our authentic lived experiences. So throughout today, I might mention something about my past or I might use my disability as, a, as an example. Um, and if you think something resonates with you or your experience, please do, if you would like to share that in the chat so others can also get a feel for the experiences that we have in the UK um, and anything that might uh, crop up that you want to, to share with others. You don't have to, of course, those are quite personal things. For those that haven't met me before, my name is Piers Wilkinson. I use they, them pronouns, um, and I am part of the inclusive education team here at DNA. Um, particularly, I work on policy and campaigns, uh, and this is a passion area of mine for anyone that's met me before knows that I can talk all day about disability history. But that's enough about me and DNA. So the session today, we've only got roughly just under an hour now. Um, going to go a little bit on the introductions and the housekeeping, just a couple of ground rules about the use of the chat um, and the q and function. Uh, we're going to touch on the origins of disability history. Many people have heard of Disability History Month before, uh, but don't actually know where it's come from or when it started. So the little bit on that, we've got a, a very model approach, which is touching on the social model and uh, all of the other models that do exist in and about the disabled community. Um, we're going to touch on the big part of today, which is looking at uh, what I've named the deserving and the undeserving, which is looking at the legacy and the impact of uh, our rights and uh, the legislation that's existed in the UK over time. And hopefully some of it might shock you, something you might not have heard of before. Um, but also talk about how it in fact impacts on today's present day. We're going to then touch on the legacy of language and rights, specifically the legacy of language in particular, and whether or not I'm going to be putting forward some rhetorical questions that you can feel free to answer in the chat if you like, um, about whether or not we do have rights, whether or not those rights are uh, enacted in a way that we do have access to them. And then at the end, um, as this is a uh, what we like to do at DNA, we have a whole bunch of resources available. My colleague Charlie will be linking them, so don't worry too much. And we'll send around uh, an information pack and also citations um, and further reading bits that I will mention later today. Um, and then we will have the Q&A, hopefully about 10 minutes of Q&A, where you can ask me uh, anything about today's session and uh, anything really about disability and policy and politics and campaigns that you, you may have wanted to ask but haven't been able to. Just a little bit, um, you shouldn't be able to unmute. Um, but if you do, uh, for some reason, we've not set up the settings correctly, uh, please don't um, uh, unmute unless there's a very specific reason. If you would uh, like to be, please do use the chat. If that is not accessible, uh, do uh, let us know uh, via direct message as best as you can, and we will try at the end to unmute those um, to uh, have a conversation. Importantly, this is a safe and inclusive space for, for us all. What this means is that there is no such thing as a silly question. Um, and to to put that bluntly in the best way that I can, I like to share the fact that when I delivered a session a couple of years back for the Welsh Assembly, I uh, was asked the question of how do I have sex? Um, so I can trust, I can really emphasize there's no such thing as a silly question. There's no question that you can ask that I probably won't have been asked before. So please do feel free to ask questions, um, even if you feel a bit silly asking them. We're all here to learn. There is a small caveat on that, which is uh, because it's an inclusive learning space, we won't tolerate any hate or dis discrimination or harassment or racism in, in this webinar. We don't expect it. We have a very good track record with the services that we put on and the webinars and training that we put on. Um, but that's just a little caveat. It needs to be an inclusive space for all. Um, and also for those to be patient, for those that do not know, it is a learning space. And I will try and address them as we can. And as the last point, please put questions or, uh, in the chat or in the QA box, and uh, we'll get to them when we can. Just as a little thing as well, as it is an inclusive learning space, I will just say quickly that uh, because of the subjects of today, we are looking at the British history, uh, the UK history. Um, so there are a couple of content warnings in place. So feel free to um, stop and uh, leave the, the webinar now if uh, there are any particular of the subjects I'm about to mention um, are, are not groovy for you um, and those are we're going to be talking about disabilism we're going to be talking about abuse we're going to be talking about racism and we're going to be talking about some of the um more difficult parts of disability history that does often get forgotten about or glossed over so 
whilst I'll try and keep a positive spin towards the end and keep it celebratory and uplifting, uh, we can't forget the fact that British imperialism, colonialism, and its own treatment of its people is not uh, the, the, the shiniest of histories. But uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, whoops, spasms, let's get started. So for those that haven't encountered Disability History Month before, um, it officially really in the UK got started in 2010, which followed on from a, a survey to schools about when would best be helpful to have a discussion about disability history and teach children and young people about uh, our movement, our rights, our, our struggle for, um, for equality. Um, and therefore, it was decided to follow on the 22nd of November to the 22nd of uh, the to the 22nd of December and um, thank you for the comment about reading anything out that's on the slides uh, I will do so um, and it's a really good window even though it's not a specific first to the end of the month because it encapsulates encapsulates quite a few uh, key important dates for disabled people in the UK, which is World AIDS Day, which is the 1st of December, International Day of Disabled People, or you may see it as the International Day of Persons with Disability on the 3rd of December, and the International Human Rights Day, which is the 10th of December. And particularly for when this is done in schools or when you're talking to schools, and um, some of you I know do interact with schools, it does follow on from National Bullying Week as well. And we do know 2.5 times more likely uh, to be bullied are disabled people than their non-disabled peers. And fundamentally, it is just about um, teaching the history of our struggle as disabled people uh, for equality and human rights. Uh, and that's why um, we're putting on the session today. Uh, on the right hand side is the logo for UK Disability History Month. It's a, a black triangle. In the centre is a yellow circle, which just reads um, with the text inside that reads UK Disability History Month. Um, it's important to note, however, that uh, despite Disability History Month being um, fairly new, given that it's about 12 years, um, uh, 12 years old in 2022, there is still an issue with uh, Disability History Month in that the community often has yet to uh, account for or even touch on um, UK colonialism and imperialism with meaningful sensitivity. So this is just a reminder that whenever you're engaging with Disability History Month, to bear in mind that the community is not a homogenous group, uh, and importantly, that there are aspects, particularly when we touch on health and well-being, that we need to take uh, extra steps to recognise uh, both the contribution of and the voices of uh, every single person in, in the disabled community. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the theme for this year is health and wellbeing. So um, at the start, I'm not going to go into too much detail on models because there's excellent literature and guides and resources out there. We've got a couple on our own website about specific module, um, models. But there are quite a few models and there have been many that have been used differently throughout uh, the history of the UK. Um, so not many people know, once my hand stops shaking, not many people know that there are at least 16 models uh, within existing literature. Um, I had a fun task the other day from an email that I received, which was how many models exist in the UK. Uh, and I spent a good hour going through my own notes, going through the existing literature that I have um, stored, the books that I have, just noting down all of the different models that have been published in literature or, or come up by community groups. And there's at least 16, uh, probably double that, many more than that. But importantly, the main point of how many models there are is that there is no one model that is the right size for all. However, throughout this webinar, we're going to be using the social model of disability. The social model of disability um, in a simple sentence is that we are disabled by society and the design of society through uh, inaccessibility um, that disables us. So it's the barriers that we face that is the disabling part of our disabled identity uh, rather than our individual impairments or conditions. There are criticisms of that model, and that is why there's so many that have been suggested, such as the rights-based model or the affirmational model. Um, and we will be touching on something called the charity model uh, later on. Um, but predominantly throughout history has been a medicalized model where a, a, a doctor or a 
medical professional of some kind is the one that interacts with the disabled person. Some of you in the educational space may have encountered the professional model. The professional model is just as it sounds. It's about disability professionals interacting with disabled people and supporting them with the, the aspects of accessing support. Um, uh, and it, but it still relies on a, a diagnostic type background, but doesn't necessarily require a medical degree or a medical background. Uh, for anyone that's been to university, works in university, or um, has access to the Disabled Students Alliance, the professional model is what the DSA is kind of based off of, in that professionals talk with you and help create um, a package of support. What uh, many people do not realize, though, is that the social definition of disability comes from a base understanding in the UK of um, from uh, experiences of uh, racism and um, challenging apartheid in South Africa back in the 60s and 70s. Um, and that we in the UK wouldn't have the 50 years of the social model if uh, if it hadn't have been learn and experiences shared from fighting apartheid uh, and um, fighting racism to be able to express ourselves within the, the model that has been so used and adopted by the community that we have. Uh, it's an important uh, aspect that we remember, particularly when we liken back to what I said uh, only a few minutes ago about uh, the about the experiences of um, Black disabled people in the UK uh, and other ethnic minority groups. Importantly, um, one of the people that define the social model is Victor Finkelstein, who was not only a disabled person that was imprisoned for his anti-apartheid activities in South Africa, but he actually came to the UK and as a refugee uh, and joined the emerging disabled people's movement. Um, and in uh, collaboration with an organization called UPS, the Union of the Physically Impaired Against Segregation in 1972, coined uh, or, or led to the development of the social definition of disability, which we now know as the social model of disability. And it's important that we recognize models when we talk about disability and we look at the history of disability uh, that center the voices, experiences and wishes of the disabled community. So even though there are 16 models, I always recommend that whichever one you do subscribe to, you follow the ones that are built, designed and adopted by the community that you're working with. So in the UK, that is the social model. However, internationally, that may be other models. We now get on to probably the least fun, but most interesting aspect of today's talk. Um, we're going to be looking at the deserving and undeserving culture that has been created through legislative and uh, public uh, actions in the UK. Um, on the right hand side is a photo from the historic uh, from historic England, which depicts the Ashton Union Workhouse. Um, for those that have read Charles Dickens or any other literature. Or, or, or material about uh, the Victorian times will have probably encountered the phrase workhouse before, but probably may not have encountered the full reality of why and how and what they were for. Um, uh, the image is a black and white photo of um, the Ashton Union Workhouse, which is a very large building um, with uh, many, many, many rooms and windows, it's about three stories. Uh, all of the windows have bars on them. So when we talk about history in the UK, I always like to liken back to some of the very first laws that came into the UK, where we uh, can go before 1533. Um, 1533 is when um, the Poor Law Act was introduced. Um, there's De Prerogative Regis, which is just Latin for by the prerogative of the king. Uh, which uh, there's lots and lots of little bits and pieces that have evolved over time through that, which can be likened to um, supporting disabled people. But fundamentally, when we talk about uh, the deserving and undeserving disabled people or poor people, we have to look at the poor laws. And uh, all the way back in 1535, they required towns and parish councils to look after every aged, poor and impotent person. That is the language of the, the act. 
and that was only for a, a period of three years. The reason why on the screen 1535 has a plus next to it is because from 1535 to the early uh, 1600s, there was quite a few revisions and updates to the poor laws uh, that made them the first complete code of poor relief uh, for, and I quote here, the lame, impotent, old, blind, and other such beings, poor and not able to work. So this is one of the very first times we have in law statutory relief, which is good. However, we have this likening all the way directly to only supporting people that cannot work. So it starts this introduction of um, disability being based on the ability to work, to being productive to a capitalist society. In 1601, we then get what is probably quite a small revision for many, but actually underpins the next 700 years uh, to, a, to, a, to a degree, oh, sorry, 600 years, which makes economic provision dependent on charity. So this means that you have religion and you have uh, charitable organizations that existed back then, almost entirely Christian, deciding who, what, when, and how disabled people are classed as disabled people, whether or not they receive relief, um, and ensuring that you, individual members of society can't support uh, the poor or disabled that they see um, uh, out of that in their daily lives. In 1834, so jumping forward a bit, we get something called the Poor Law Amendment Act. And this is why the, the photo of the, the workhouse was on the screen. So everyone maybe knows that uh, workhouses were terrible. They were absolutely horrific. They were abusive. They um, were um, predatory. Um, and they were uh, a way of segregating the poor in society from being visible. But what many people don't know is that in 1834, not only were the conditions bad, but they had to be bad by the act. They enshrined that conditions within the workhouses should always be worse than the conditions outside of them. So that means that uh, even if you're out on the street and uh, experiencing hardship, the workhouses had to be worse than the worst possible situation outside of receiving uh, support. Um, and they introduced the start of testing. Uh, the workhouse test, which meant that relief should only be available to those in the workhouse. So not only do we have the start of introduction of sort of the workhouse test or the means testing or fitness to work testing, as we sometimes might know it later on, but we have in it uh, this fact that you can only receive support through these appropriate means. These agreed places that, might I remind people, is defined as having to be worse than anywhere else. So not only is the support segregated into specific areas and um, institutions, but those institutions have to have the worst conditions. Uh, and what this meant is that a lot of people, uh, including disabled people that wanted to live independently, were being forced into these institutions to receive any support. In 1845, so only 11 years later, we get something called the Lunacy Act and the Kelton Asylums Act. This is a very niche bit of disability history. Um, but it's the first time that uh, asylums actually had to have a physician present. So before this, people could be admitted or uh, confined to an asylum with no uh, accounting or requiring of uh, any professional to ensure that they actually needed to be there or should be there. And importantly, not only do they have the resident physician, we get something where patients have, lose their right to challenge their detention. So if you're put in an asylum, you have no right to say that you shouldn't be there. And we see this being used punitively and disproportionately on migrants, uh, poor people and working class people, um, in particular ethnic minorities. And the Act also set up something called the Lunacy Commission, uh, which stressed the early need for, sorry, the need for early removal from the home. And this is the very start of removing uh, disabled children from familiar households, either with the consent of the family or the family deciding to put them there in the first place, as we've seen in some prominent aspects of history. Uh, where it's the entire removal of the application for the entire removal of disabled people from mainstream society into these institutions where they then lose their right to challenge the fact that they're there. Lord Ashley, who was one of the people that um, sponsored the bill, 
uh, and brought it in. Speeches of the introduction of these county asylums and these restrictions as being uh, part of creating massive savings for the poor law, um, uh, so quote unquote, burden on, on the taxpayer. So this is where we start to see cost savings and the erasure of, erasure of disabled people's rights being put hand in hand. Uh, and anyone that has been following politics of recently might see the massive savings and cuts to social security and social support as a when we've not quite moved on from uh, 1845. In 1886, we then move on to something called the Idiot Act. Many of you have probably used the word idiot in everyday speech or um, even about yourself or about other people may not know that it was enshrined in law as a category of disability. And it was uh, one of the ways in which there was a legal definition and distinction of the difference between idiots, imbeciles and lunatics. Um, and the, the parlance or the common use of these words um, are still around even today. Uh, and it is a uh, a part of history that I don't think many people know about and something I wanted to highlight is that a lot of these um, acts are not enshrining of rights, but about segregating and isolating disabled people into bespoke categories uh, without consultation or meaningful engagement. In 1890, we then get uh, an amendment to the Lunacy Act, which bring in a system of orders and certificates to help prevent the wrongful admission of people to asylums. Importantly, it didn't do that. It was uh, legislation that wasn't quite effective in, in its instance. But the most important part of 1890, though, is that a necessary restraint becomes an offence. So 130 years ago, a necessary restraint uh, is now uh, an illegal uh, offence. However, I'm sure many, many people on today's call know that unnecessary restraint still pertains to be a significant issue for disabled people in social care settings and assisted living settings and within um, healthcare settings, as well as within the, the policing uh, system as well, uh, with once again, disproportionate impact on uh, individuals within uh, and communities within the disabled community. In 1913, so, Jumping to sort of early modern history, we get an even greater regression in, uh, in, in law, which is called the Mental Deficiency Act. You might get the theme that none of these are very positive in their wording, but the Mental Deficiency Act categorized people even further, but in particular people with learning disabilities and mental health issues as idiots, imbeciles, feeble-minded or moral defectives. So we start to see the introduction of this idea that disabled people um, are sort of morally defective um, or that sort of immoral behaviour in and of itself is a disability. Um, some of you may know the links there with the LGBT plus community uh, and as you can see disability history is intrinsically linked with uh, all of the other communities and um, disadvantaged groups within UK society. Additionally, uh, what you may not know is that unmarried mothers began to be placed in this more defective category too. So we start seeing all of the bad things, quote unquote, about society that people like Winston Churchill, um, who joined the Eugenic Society, and other prominent politicians could categorise the, the people they disdained to see in society as moral defectives and have them brought under this Mental Deficiency Act. Uh, distinction and incarcerated, institutionalized, or segregated from society. Once again, we see that theme of out of sight, out of mind, you're over there. Importantly, this act does lead to many, many more people with learning difficulties being institutionalized. Uh, and by that, I mean placed in an institution uh, where they don't really have a right to challenge their detention uh, and, and stuck there for the rest of their life. So the key themes from 700 years of British history to do with health and well-being is that up until the before the First World War, things weren't going well. Whilst in the early 1900s, we did have the, um, or late 1800s, I should say, the Royal National Institute for the Blind, um, which back then was called the Deaf and Blind Association. Um, start to be created, which was created by disabled people to represent their interests. 
we still have legislation that is all about removing us from society, making sure we're not visible. So if you ever see a building in London that is older than the 1940s, there's a big reason why there was nothing to do with access uh, going into that, and that's because we weren't allowed to be a part of society. But importantly for today, I want people to take home is that we have legislative categorization of disability using slurs that we know of today uh, as the legal classifications. It was all about segregation from society and institutionalization. It was about centering a charity culture and a culture of those that are deserving of support based on their ability to work, which some may know still exists today. Anyone that has been following the conversations around um, universal credit and whether or not people on universal credit should have mobile phones or TVs may see in live action the, the legacy of these acts that centered the receipt of support, the, the, the arms that were received by individuals who were facing poverty, the impact of class and racism on those that were disproportionately impacted by these bits of legislation, all being intrinsically linked with some of the culture that we still struggle with and challenge with in today's society. Uh, in terms of a legislative context, even today, we see that cost cutting, the sort of you must be at your worst, you must be on the verge of starvation or on the verge of death to receive support um, and the hiding of deaths in institutions or the, the, the hiding of reports that go into details about deaths related to these institutions such as workhouses were all hidden away. Um, from society, from the main population. And importantly, that can be said to not have changed much even today. We still have the Department for Work and Pensions, for example, having yet to publish the multiple inquiries into benefit-related deaths. We still have those conversations that I spoke about on social media where people are saying, um, the minority, I will say, are saying about who should and shouldn't receive support. And we still have this talk about massive savings to the taxpayer, value for money to the taxpayer, and the, the condition of support for disabled people being based on our, our value to contribute to society rather than just our right to exist as people. There is a caveat. I have spoken about a lot of the negative things about these, these acts. Um, weaved throughout are some more positive things, and these weren't entirely negative. There were some small wins um, as we progress through history. But majority of the time, before the uh, First World War, there wasn't much in the way of progress. We're now going to touch on the legacy of these language rights. I've talked about them slightly, but I want to touch more on specifically with the impact on uh, the latter 1900s and with a focus on the, the health and well-being theme of today. Just quickly, on the right hand side of this slide, you will see a photo of the 2019 student protests at the very front of um, what is thousands of people, not quite visible in the photo, but thousands of people at a protest with lots and lots of banners stretched across the road are two wheelchair users. Uh, those that are um, acutely perceptive may notice that it is me in a high vis jacket in my wheelchair at the front of this protest. And I am indeed wearing a T-shirt that reads, I run better than the government. But when we talk about the legacy of disability rights in the UK, disability history, we have to talk about protests. We have to talk about how a lot of the rights uh, that we have won in further time have come from direct action. And we can trace direct action all the way back to 1297. We have a very long history of community organizing against institutional abuse and, the, and for the implementation of rights. Um, if anyone received the email that I sent out ahead of this, I did mention 1297. Um, and what happened in 1297 is there was a leper house, as it was called in Norfolk, that mutinied against the abbots. So once we see religious institution um, and his men um, for the fact that they were stealing from the, the people they were meant to be looking after. Um, and in this action, they looted and demolished a lot of the buildings of the, the, the abbots um, and the the, the house uh, and unfortunately killed the dog, dog, dog that was there as well. Now, when I often tell that uh, bit of history, many people's first reactions is, oh no, the, 
the dog part, the dog died in the ensuing um, direct action. And whilst I don't condone any abuse to animals, I will say when you think about that reaction that you may have had to think about why does a leper house run by an abbot and the, the, the church in that time require a guard dog to support disabled people that they're meant to be looking after? I won't answer that rhetorical question, but it's something to think about is why is there a guard dog? But importantly, in the 1900s, as I mentioned, we saw the rise of charity. Some of them that still exist to today were created by disabled people for disabled people. However, the vast majority that rose in the early 1900s advocated on behalf of disabled people. And importantly, this comes to a conflict um, in the post-World War I era where we see a lot of riots and marches and protests on the first anniversary of Armistice Day. One of the largest mass politicization of ex-servicemen was that protest in the 1920s, uh, one year after Armistice Day, where they protested against the charity model of support. And the slogan that was given was, don't pity us, give us work. And we see this echoed in the late 90s, where we have the telethon protests, uh, which I'll include a link to in the pack that we send afterwards. However, importantly, a lot of the protests that achieved significant change and change in public opinion post World War I and World War II in the 1940s and 50s were the veteran movement protests. And this is where we link back to deserving and undeserving disabled people. We had success in the 1940s and 50s and the early 1920s because of the fact that there were two massive world wars where hundreds of thousands of uh, British and uh, people from the Commonwealth were injured, uh, survived the war, but then were disabled as a result of the war, whether that be physically or mentally or any of the myriad ways in which you can acquire disability in war. But that it was acceptable to society to see, actually, no, we should be helping these people. Um, but unfortunately, when in the 1940s, bills were going through Parliament to support uh, these ex-service people, these disabled people, into having the right to have a job, into accessing society, to accessing education. Nye Bevan, who some of you may know as, quote unquote, the founder of the NHS, had to stand up and advocate on behalf of all disabled people, stating that the measures within these bills have to apply to all disabled people and not just ex-servicemen. So whilst there were successes, we see this, um, by the word I'm looking for, this uh, divided nature of the British establishment into segregating us once again into the types of disabled people that we are and valuing some disabled people over others when as a community we must and should continue looking forward uh, advocating as a collective rather than breaking down into impairment based groups, which can be helpful for community reasons, but engaging importantly with the community so that no individual group or community get left behind. I just want to reiterate about the historical nature of Disability History Month and the importance of making sure that applies to every community that is part of the uh, disabled people's community. So we're getting on to the pun that I used for the title of this, which is looking back in the 1970s. So as I mentioned 50 years ago, we had the Union of the Physically Impaired Against Segregation, UPS. And this was a disabled movement that organized based on physical impairment that directly challenged the charities that were running uh, the health services or the uh, assisted living centers or social care provision that existed in their time and importantly their history of abuse which continued all the way up into the early 2000s and if you were to just google social care abuse or assisted living center abuse into google you will find article after article dating back from only a couple of months ago every couple of months for the last 50 years so their campaign against the abuses is still something that is relevant of today to mention. But unfortunately, because of the way in which the legacy of the poor laws, the legacy of the laws that I've mentioned about segregated, uh, segregated uh, institutions, 
meant that many of the people who joined UPS, we don't know who they are. We don't know our history in the disabled community for so many of the individuals that led the fight because they couldn't record their names on UPS's charter or members register because they lived in and were challenging the charities that provided the critical care, the critical support to their access to society, their access to their friends, their access to living. And were challenging those and feared the reprisal of their activities of saying, I deserve rights, I deserve to not be mistreated, I deserve access to everything else that non-disabled people have um, for just stating their rights. And importantly, therefore, this had a disproportionate impact on those that um, come from an ethnic minority, but black disabled people in particular, uh, the generation of Windrush and a couple of the, the, the other sort of more key components of post-World War II uh, emigration and immigration that the UK had. I can't really, uh, we've only got 20 minutes left, so I can't go into the whole diabolical system of the British imperialist and colonialist empire as a whole. However, it's important to note that those that were in assisted living centres more likely to put in institutions were likely to be um, uh, disabled immigrants or disabled um, black community members uh, within the, the abuse that they might have faced or did face, I should say. However, if you do want a good perspective on the, the intrinsic links between the legacy of uh, inappropriate or, or wrong use of so-called disability support being used to uh, to to racialize and abuse um, uh, communities, uh, ethnic minority communities. I highly recommend Akala's book, Natives, Raising Class in the Ruins of Empire. He has an excellent section where he talks about his experience of education only 20, 30 years ago and how uh, his experience of the structures that are met, uh, put in place to support disabled people were used in a, in a racialized manner. Uh, and I highly recommend uh, those books from the lived experience uh, of those that, exp uh, that encountered it. But we can see that in today through the impact of social care charges, community care charges. And uh, yes, Liz, we'll send it around in the, in the information pack, a quick link. Um, but we see this in social care charges in the impact being disproportionately felt by the impoverished communities that we have in the UK and being disproportionate impact in being able to access society again and fight back against the, the removal of rights. When we talk about healthcare, we can't not talk about the NHS. We have to state that uh, only 3.5% of NHS professionals declare their disability on the electronic staff record. So not only are disabled people facing challenges in, in engaging with healthcare, engaging with their health and wellbeing, in accessing the services that are there, that are, were amazingly created in the 1940s to be the, the amazing NHS that we know and love today, despite the underfunding and other issues with it, is that that's not an actual accurate record of disabled people in the NHS. 19% or thereabouts uh, respond as disabled or identify as disabled in anonymous staff surveys done by unions and, and sector partners of the NHS. So we know that there are roughly the same number of disabled people in society as there are staff members in the NHS. And yet we still have that medicalized culture, that uh, stigma culture, where the people in the know about health conditions are still stigmatized in accessing or interacting or declaring or being able to be confident without reprisal. And reprisal is an important thing when we talk about health and well-being and being able to advocate for your rights as a, as a person in the UK who uh, identifies as disabled or uh, in any other form. We also have to focus on intersectional disparities within the medicalized nature of disability that we have in the UK. We've talked about the workhouses, we've talked about the, the introduction of um, uh, physicians to to asylums, but we still haven't talked about the fact that for many, many, many years, and still to today, disabled people can't be part of medical research surveys or studies 
because of the, the nature of some of the scientific endeavors that they're trying to do, try and limit the number of factors that may play in. But this means that when it comes to accessing diagnostics, accessing prescriptions, accessing care that reflects yourself, your community and the condition that you're facing, it's often done without the individual in question. And importantly, when we talk about fitness to work, fitness to practice, uh, the harassment and the competency standards or challenges to competency standards that happen within our society in the UK, both historically and today, it is particularly disabled black women within the NHS that will have their colleagues challenge them, uh, claiming that because they're disabled that they can't adequately perform their duties, even if they've been a disabled person for 10, 20 years and only recently declared it. So it's important when we do look back that when we look forward that we are righting these wrongs as we go and we are aware of the, the legacy that, that, that can occur within these institutions that we love. And importantly, community care and independent living, which I've touched so much on and what UPS were struggling for and fighting for, um, is something that we still need to fight for despite its regression of the community care charges uh, and the, the, the availability and access to independent living fund universal credit. So summarizing in, in its total, we have the good, the bad, the ugly, and the legacy. Apologies for using the good, bad, and the ugly thing. I like to include references and puns in my work. So we have the 130 years of unnecessary restraint being illegal. We have the post-war repeals of a lot of the acts that I spoke about. We have the, the laws that we know and love today, the 1975 Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act, the 1995 uh, Disability Discrimination Act, the 2000 um, Representation of the People Act that gave certain people in uh, mental health institutions the right to vote again. These are great. I'm not saying they aren't. There can be work that can be done. However, we are still on a rights-based model that relies on a judicial system where people have to fight for their rights via civil suits, via legal suits, via um, employment tribunals, rather than having a society that does that fighting for us so we don't have to constantly fight for our rights. And we still have in everyday parlance a lot of the language that was used to oppress disabled people in the past, such as the, the language that you may see on screen, such as idiot, imbecile, moral defective, feeble-minded, lunatic, lame, and impotent. Obviously impotent, and some of those have medical context. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about our everyday use of language. We still don't have meaningful access to independent living. We still have fitness work capability assessments. We still have this idea of being, if to receive support as a disabled person, it has to be based on a metric about uh, your ability or uh, availability to be productive to society rather than just the right to exist and the right to enjoy the life that you see fit. And we still have a society that thinks about uh, or have as a public perception of there being these fake disabled. Uh, tax fraud is 23 times less likely to be prosecuted than benefits crime, benefits fraud. Despite the fact that tax fraud is often nine times greater than any benefits crime, and including in benefits crime is um, the errors done by the Part for Work and Pensions and all the other parties involved. So despite the fact that we have quite a low area of so-called fake disabled, we still have this perception of deserving and undeserving in within the UK that still needs to be challenged. And we see that with what I've mentioned about what do poor people really deserve to have discussions going on? What is a nutritious meal? How much is right to give to people? So when we talk about disability history, we have to recognise that this idea of uh, value for money to the taxpayer has been used as a reason historically and reasonably quite lately to remove access, to remove funding, to remove services that disabled people critically rely on. And that results in a policing culture within the disabled community itself, where because things are being cut or because things are being discussed in this way, you have this ingrained disabled belief within quite a few people in the community and communities in the community where we police who is and isn't disabled. And that isn't something that we should be doing and we should learn from our history about trying to police the right type of disabled person. 
And importantly, when we talk about disability history, we have to remember that the definition of disability and the model that we use in the community today is based off of challenging racism and challenging abuse. So I've talked a lot uh, today about all of these things. Uh, some of them have been quite uh, depressing, unfortunately. However, the future is looking brighter. We've had people commenting in the chat from the NHS about the amazing work that is going on in the NHS, the WDES, the Workforce Disability Equality Standard. I've probably butchered that. But alongside everything that's going on in society uh, that is being done to address the widely misunderstood uh, perceptions of disability, DNA as a social enterprise, we have loads and loads of free stuff on our website. We have DSA, access to work, and NHS specific tailored guidance that Charlie's posting in the chat directly that, that is based on disabled people ourselves going through the process. It is a hoop jumping exercise for a lot of us. It is challenging to access medical diagnostic information to pay uh, for the letters to then access things because we can't afford to create support ourselves. We have, importantly, um, a higher education lived experience video series on our YouTube channel, which is the people with the experience of the different intersectional aspects of identity. So we have a series, uh, an episode on women and disability. We have an episode on, on, on race and ethnic minority experiences of disability, of care leavers experiences, uh, uh, and a whole bunch of stuff, the links in the chat where you can hear from other disabled people about their experiences, hear from the community about why it's so important to get that engagement. And importantly, we have a resource hub where you can go online to our website, use the filters that are available there to find everything from open source assistive technology to the blogs that are about individual people's experiences to guides on how to use Microsoft and Zoom and how to engage with those sorts of uh, services. Importantly, uh, next week, not next week, two weeks time, we have a conference. Our very first conference, we've called it What Inclusion Looks Like, because it's about looking forward to the future and saying, what do we want inclusion to be? What should it look like? What should inclusion look like for everyone in society? So on the 5th and 6th of December, um, we have tickets are available, of course, online. We have amazing speakers. Um, I know quite a few of you from an education background, so I'll just mention some of them. Others are on the slide behind me and we'll send a little bit more information out in the, the after, after session information pack. But we have Health Education England, amazingly talking about the amazing work going on within the NHS to challenge some of the things that I've spoken about in the NHS uh, and the, the support that is available for practitioners, learners and patients. We have the Disabled Students Commission that I'm a part of. Uh, coming to talk about uh, some cool new developments in the education sector, as well as uh, uh, a nice tasty surprise uh, for, for those that uh, are all about commitments and uh, supporting disabled students. We also have you, Kaiser, um, who are coming to talk about the International Student Charter uh, and are going to be um, uh, wonderful uh, to have at the conference and many, 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 many more people at the conference. It's going to be about social justice, it's going to be about education, it's going to be about uh, employment opportunities uh, and getting that right, uh, and it's going to be centering lived experience of disabled people. On the right hand side, uh, a couple of photos of the team. Uh, on the, uh, the first photo is my colleague Adam, who is a white man uh, with dark hair and is a wheelchair user, and on the, the right hand of him is Emma, my colleague, who's a white woman with short, dark hair as well, and glasses, and they're laughing on a podium, uh, giving the impression that we're all going to have fun at our conference. Uh, additionally, at the bottom is a photo of our CEO, Atif Jaudry, who is a brown man with short, dark hair and glasses, and he's speaking into a microphone and looking quite serious. But I promise you, he's much more fun in person. So, Thank you. And we do have discounts available, so do uh, send us a message uh, about uh, uh, if you if you need access to discounts or if you are come from a small organisation. We have quite a few um, uh, bursaries and other things available as a social enterprise. Thank you so much for coming to this talk. Uh, thank you so much for the engagement in the chat. And uh, now is the reminder to throw everything into the Q and A function or into the chat if you want me to go over things in a bit more detail or to engage with uh, 
en engage with the, the talk that we've had. But thank you so much for spending an hour of your lunchtime. Uh, solidarity to anyone that is on strike today. Uh, and I hope that you uh, have a wonderful disability history month. Ah, sorry, I just needed a drink. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the wonderful comments and chat. Uh, first Q&A question is recommending the books. Yes, 100%. Uh, one of the really good books that I recommend, and I'll see if I've got it next to me to hold up, is, nope, uh, it's on my shelf, is uh, the uh, a book called um, uh, Queer, that talks about queerness and disability theory, as well as a book that talks about uh, the prison institution and the impacts on disability and race. Um, I'll add those 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 uh, book references into uh, the the after information pack. Uh, and additionally, there's a wonderful book by one of our panelists at the conference, um, Roddy Slorak, which is available on Kindle. It's no longer in print, so you can't buy it in in, in physical copy, alas. Uh, which talks about class and disability uh, and is a really good critique of capitalism uh, and the impact on disability. We have a question from Macan Wrights, which is, I'd be really interested to learn more about how the social model and UPS came out of anti-apartheid activism and how the British Empire impacted and continues to impact disabled people outside of the UK. Do you have any recommended resources and reading on these topics? Uh, I do. Um, there's a really good video series by the Palestinian Solidarity Campaign, uh, which talks about the weaponization of disability uh, as a means uh, of war. That is something that's quite relevant to today in terms of the way in which different uh, imperialistic countries use the, the military, not just to oppress people in the usual military ways, but use the threat of disability and its strain on public health systems in the recipient country. Um, as a as a threat to anyone that would protest or or, or fight back, so it's an important uh, it's an important topic. Uh, additionally, um, I highly recommend uh, the Leeds uh, Disability Studies Archive that's freely available on the university website. That has so much information that I often find myself on a on a Friday afternoon just sitting down and perusing through uh, random papers or books that are available there that I, I uh, it's an absolutely wonderful trove of information um, and quite a few of them touch on uh, the British Empire uh, and its history of uh, the weaponization of disability uh, in particular on uh, indigenous uh, and local populations through the Commonwealth um, as well as the the interlinking of moral defectives and uh, those aspects didn't just happen in the UK. There's uh, quite a few really good resources uh, available. I'll see if I can find them for you for the information pack on uh, the British Empire's legacy impact on early removal from the home of uh, native and indigenous people uh, into Christian white households. Uh, but that's replicated across many of the British Commonwealth uh, in its history but it uh, has a nice int int interesting link into uh, how um, the the sort of eugenic society's focus on uh, disabled people wasn't just on disabled people, it was on ethnic minorities, it was on indigenous populations. Um, and you only just have to look at certain comments by certain prime ministers of the time about how they thought of uh, th these types of people, but I can't go too much into that without uh, losing quite a few people. Uh, but thank you so much for that question. It's really good, uh, really, really good question. Feminist queer and crip by any chance? It isn't, it isn't. I think it's called queering disability. Uh, I, ha I had it, but as a disabled person, I put things down. I never know where I put them down. It's probably underneath the seat cushion on my wheelchair. So if I do find it, I will link it. We have 
Med uh, you yeah, mentioned the problem of medicalized assessment, but the Swiss model, for instance, bases there's far more thorough and extensive support in medical assessments, not, as with our DUEP, everyday proofs of difficulties in living. Such systems are not moralistic, but far more respectful. Wouldn't using a professional medical model remove the stigma? I think that there are many models throughout the, the, the Europe, as well as the, the rest of the world, that take the important aspect of any assessment which is tailoring it to the individual and discussing the barriers that they face. So rather than having a medical approach of uh, what diagnosis do you have, which is what we have when you first apply for things in the UK often, is instead reframing the question as to what is the barriers that you face. And that can be a medical context, which is very helpful for those of us with chronic health conditions. Because the social model does not reflect well our experiences of chronic fatigue uh, and chronic pain. No amount of change in society is going to change the fact that I hurt every day of and every minute of the day. So there are the sort of the good and the bad of many different types of models throughout uh, many different countries. Um, but importantly, I think for me the most the most important aspect is uh, having a professional on hand during any sort of assessment is useful to recontextualize in experience to know what the support they have. The important thing about that is assistive technology. Many young disabled people or recently acquired disabled, recently acquired a disability disabled people don't know what they don't know. Uh, when entering a new environment, it's really difficult to understand how the support that I received in school or the support I received from my local sport team would uh, work in an educational environment or a workplace environment. So a professional is necessary to be able to contextualize that, but it has to be done in the context of uh, the sort of celebratory rights-based affirmation or understanding of the environment rather than an innate understanding of the medical diagnosis itself. To, to a degree, I personally believe, uh, and I hope DNA also uh, backs me up with this, and the conversations we've had do echo that, that sometimes diagnosis is really not required or a medicalized approach is really not required when the information you need is what barriers does someone face, what adjustments do they need, uh, is there anything else we can do to help? That's why DNA uh, on our website, you'll find a celebratory model approach that you may enjoy. But good question, thank you. Will any of the conference sessions be streamed online? Looks fantastic, but I'm a fair way from Britain. <laughs> so uh, we do have a digital package, I believe. Um, if you contact either myself or the team at DNA, we'll be able to provide more information uh, about uh, what's going to be available after the conference uh, and the, the digital aspect of the conference itself. I don't believe we're doing a hybrid model um, due to the, the limitations of the event. We also have limited numbers. So if you do want to come, do book your ticket soon. Um, in terms of how it will be linked up. But that's a, it's something that we will be running online in the future as well. Uh, and we do plan on running more of these webinars, uh, these free open source webinars to share our knowledge more. And also because I like talking. If people who don't know me talk to the people that do know me, they know that. <laughs> Any recommendations for resources to learn more about disability history? Uh, yes, the number one resource that I would recommend, uh, and I'll look, include a link where I spent a lot of my time alongside the Leeds archive and the books that I've mentioned, is something called Study More. It's a website created by a disabled person that has so, so, so much information on the nitty gritty details of legislative and contextual history of uh, disabled people in the UK. It even has some things that the UK government's archive on uh, Parliament doesn't have, which is absolutely fantastic. I think it's called study, studymore.org.uk or something like that. And I highly, highly, ah, thank you, Charlie. It's totally inaccessible in terms of uh, the fact that it's just so much information. Um, but I do highly recommend checking it out, sticking with it and doing a, a dive into it like you would a Wikipedia uh, sidetrack on a Friday afternoon. Uh, conference will be recorded, uh, aspects will be recorded uh, with a digital pack afterwards, um, but do get in touch with us uh, about what we have available uh, on the conference. What do you think the average person can do day to day to support disability awareness? I think uh, one of the most important things that the average person in the UK can do to support disability awareness is 
email their member of parliament uh, and engage in politics as best as you can to challenge or to fight for what the community is fighting for. Now, I understand that this question is probably more organised towards the public, but as we've seen from some of the legislative acts is that what gets passed through parliament is uh, often what influences public opinion. Hence why the news often focuses on disability fraud, even though it's in the 0.1% or something ridiculous like that uh, level for disability benefits. In actual fact, it costs more to have checks and balances and assessments for disability related social security than it does to just not have it. The implementation of it costs more. It's, it's a ridiculous situation where if they didn't have any checks and balances, uh, they would actually save money. So fundamentally, in terms of disability awareness and our rights, uh, challenging your local member of parliament to better engage with their local DPO, Disabled People's Organization, I think is number one. Uh, number two is getting closer acquainted with your local disabled people's community. Uh, York has a great uh, disability forum and a collective. And almost every place in the country that has a city nearby has a disability community that wants you to engage, wants you to come along to their events, wants you to support their calls for change in the local environment, whether that's York in its uh, emissions free zone and its low emissions zone impacting on uh, disabled people's access to the city centre, or whether it's in London and it's things that the London Mayor or putting on or Manchester, where I came from, we often put on uh, uh, events and opportunities to get involved, whether it was a, a monthly zine or a, a webinar or just, a, just an evening of celebrating disabled artists. There's lots and lots of things that the amazing network of disabled people organizations do day in, day out. Uh, I do say, having been part of quite a few across the country, uh, I could always do with an extra bit of bit of engagement and support sharing on social media and all that sort of funsies. But in the, as of tomorrow, I'd say one of the things that I'd suggest you do is check out some of the, the do's and don'ts articles on our website. Uh, which very nicely explain how best to interact with disabled people. So my general philosophy is when engaging with a disabled person and you think they might need help, ask them if they say no, let them fail. Uh, as someone that is a stubborn person and has climbed a rock wall in my wheelchair and has accidentally lost a wheelchair in a salt marsh, we're human. Sometimes we might need help and it's very obvious that we do need help, but we might be prideful, we might be wanting to try and do something for ourselves for once. Uh, so if we say no, move on, that's okay. Uh, but at the same time, if you see me in the supermarket, please do help me get things down from the top shelf because uh, with the cuts to staffing in supermarkets, I spend more time trying to find someone to help than I do uh, trying to do my shopping. But there are those three answers for you. Is there any ways to get involved in DNA or hear more about future sessions? Yes, uh, on our website, uh, we have a newsletter that you can subscribe to. Uh, we all have the data protection aspects and all that funsies for the different aspects but our newsletter is 100 percent the best way to get engaged with uh with our uh, everything we put on uh, and importantly if you follow our social media um whether it's uh, twitter whilst it still exists facebook linkedin uh, trying to think of all of them uh i really should have had a social media slide um but particularly Twitter at the moment uh, and LinkedIn, if you were at D and A inclusion, uh, there we go. Thank you, Charlie. I uh, love I love my colleague Charlie. He's great He's filling in all those things. Uh, you can also uh, catch anything that we advertise on there: the free webinar sessions, the blogs, the articles, um, and uh, you're always welcome to follow me on social media for some maybe spicier takes on what's going on in the political world as a policy person and as a campaigner. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of my job to sometimes post some controversial takes on what's going on in politics, if you wanted more stuff to do with what's going on in the disabled politics world. Um, ooh. Will the recording of this webinar be available? It would be great to share with colleagues. Uh, the recording that we took of the webinar will be available to those that requested it uh, as an access requirement. Uh, we don't. Uh, we do have a general policy of the recording being available for two months, uh, and 
we will potentially list it as, an as a private video on YouTube. However, because we want to make it accessible and we have a conference coming up, this probably isn't going to happen until uh, late December, early New Year. So it might come as a Christmas present to attendees via email, or it might come as a New Year gift uh, there and then, uh, just because we want to make sure that the video that we share, the recording, uh, is accessible. Um, and uh, we have a conference <laughs> around the corner that uh, means that the editing time, for those that don't know, it can take up to five times the length of a session to uh, to, to make accessible a recording. So for this hour, it can take up to five, six hours to make it accessible. So yes, it will be available via a link via email. Uh, and for those specifically that requested it as an adjustment, uh, but it might not be for a little while, apologies. But thank you so much for your questions. I'm just going to quickly go through the chat with my screen reader and see if there was any in the chat box rather than the Q&A box. Uh, we've got a question on military and disability. I think military disability is a, is a very dichotomous history in that on the one side we had the riots and protests and marches in the 1920s foundation of the british legion uh and the 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 rights that came out of that and the the, the sort of profile raising but on the other hand it is also a weapon of disability so it's a it's a very interesting situation to be in with the military where we have both the, the furtherment of imperialism and the furtherment of disability rights from ex-service members. And it's a topic that I'm very, very interested in, and I'll try and share as much context and uh, further reading as I can. Uh, but it's something that I'm not the expert in, uh, and I, I highly recommend uh, a couple of colleagues out in the sector that, that focus more on it. So uh, there's a couple of people that are associated with the Palestinian Solidarity Campaign, for example, uh, that are really, really good on uh, touching on the British Empire, uh, the legacy of the British Empire, and the historical military context of, of that day. I'm more of a, a general populist aficionado uh, that, that, that speaks on the weaponization of disability specifically. Growing disability EQ. Sorry, my screen reader really sucks right now. Uh, thank you so much for, for everyone. Unless there's any further questions, Uh, thank you so much to everyone that shared your stories in the chat. But uh, I'll do a last call for questions. Do just check them in the chat. If you, uh, if you want to get in contact with the education team specifically because of the work that we do within education or the NHS that we're partnering with HEE on, you'll see their logo potentially somewhere next to me. Um, Please do get in touch. Um, I will put, I think Charlie will put both our contact emails, uh, the education email into the chat. And you will also find our inclusive campus resource online as well. So uh, that's a wonderful little uh, package on uh, what we do, uh, how we achieve change, and what does inclusive campus really look like. Everything from education to social opportunities to staff recruitment to the support that staff receive because disabled students are not unaware of the conditions of staff and that is why you will see uh, disabled student networks championing uh, staff rights alongside their own uh, uh, as well as uh, what we do and support union-based organizing as well uh, what does accessible campaigning look like is something that i i really personally enjoy as someone that has run campaigns in the past uh, and it's uh, it's, a, it's a cool nifty little thing that i that i'm quite proud of but otherwise, thank you so, so, so much for spending this hour with me. It has been a, a true privilege and pleasure. I know many disabled people don't get the opportunity to deliver a webinar to uh, tens, if not 100 people uh, for Disability History Month. So I do just want to thank those that have stuck around afterwards as well. Thank you so, so much. Please do get in touch. Please do come along to our conference if you can. Uh, and uh, we look forward to engaging with you later on. Uh, and with the free stuff that's online. Thank you so much.